Today, we start in Canada before going on to the USA. So sit back as we go to the 19th century. Edward Ruloff was born near St. John, New Brunswick on July the 9th, 1819. He was the son of German immigrant parents. His father was a farm worker, but he tragically died when Edward was five years old. As a child, Edward loved to read and at school was an exceptional student. He taught himself languages and constantly read about plants and art, but his mother did not have very much money. So Edward was unable to continue with his studies at college and had no option other than to leave school and try and find work. In May of 1842, he found a job in the village of Dryden near Ithaca. His employer was a farmer named John Schutt and soon after starting work on the farm, Edward managed to get additional income by teaching the local school children. The local people were impressed by Edward's knowledge of most things, especially languages and botany. But John Schutt always had his reservations about the self-assured newcomer. His reservations were correct, as Edward spent much of his time talking to John's daughter, named Harriet. In 1843, Edward secured a new position, working for a botanical doctor in Ithaca. He continued to pursue Harriet, and on New Year's Eve 1843, they were married. Harriet's father John was very upset that his daughter had married Edward. He had come to believe that he was a fraud and a good talker, but not good enough for his daughter. Harriet had had other Amaras, who were much more to the liking of her father. One such Amara was Dr Henry W Bull, a cousin of the family. Well educated and well respected in local society. Harriet's marriage did not deter Dr Bull in his quest to win her affections and encouraged by her family and her brother William, he visited her at every opportunity. Soon Edward got fed up with all of Harriet's family's involvement in his marriage, so moved about 10 miles away to the village of Lansing. His reputation as a botanical physician was by now well known and he also started earning money by lecturing on the emerging science of phrenology which is the detailed study of the size and shape of a person's skull to reveal character traits and personality. Although the couple often seemed ill-suited, in 1844, Harriet announced that she was with child. On April the 12th, 1845, she gave birth to the couple's daughter, who they named Priscilla. Harriet hoped that this would bring them closer together, but the unmarried Dr. Bull's pursuit of his wife still tormented Edward. Two months later, Harriet's elder brother William asked Edward to help with his wife and child, who were in a very bad way after suffering from a bacterial infection. Despite Edward's opinion of his wife's family, he tried to help by using his botanical skills to make up a remedy for their illness. But shortly after, both mother and child died. Edward decided that he wanted to distance himself from Harriet's family, and of course, Dr. Bull so found a position as a college professor in Ohio. Harriet was very close to her family and didn't want to start a new life in an unfamiliar place. Her family were very upset with Edward for wanting to take Harriet and Priscilla away. But they were even more distraught when on June the 23rd, Harriet and Priscilla disappeared. The people of Lansing were suspicious. They asked Edward where his wife and daughter were and he told them that they had left him. Eventually, the police launched an investigation, but by the time they started, Edward had also disappeared. The police searched his house and found Harriet's clothes and jewellery. They decided that it was highly improbable that she had just left her husband. There was no evidence that she had moved out. Surprisingly, before the investigation concluded, Edward returned to Lansing and said that he and his family were now living in Ohio. This story also sounded pretty unbelievable to the local people and the investigators, but Edward was not charged and again he just left the village. Authorities were now keen to investigate the disappearance of Harriet and Priscilla and they decided to find out if they were indeed in Ohio and when it was discovered that they were not, Edward was arrested. 
It was now winter 1845. After much consideration, the authorities decided to charge him with the murder of his wife and his trial started in January 1846. The prosecution's case lacked any real evidence. Edward had always maintained that his wife had left him after an argument and taken his child. Whilst to many this seemed out of character for Harriet to have done, the police had not found any bodies. And although they had a theory that he had sunk the bodies in Lake Cayuga, nothing had been found there despite repeated dredging. Edward defended himself in court. He did well, but the jury decided that he was guilty of abduction and sentenced him to 10 years in Auburn prison. For the next decade of his life, Edward studied literature, philosophy and linguistics from inside the prison. On the day that he was released, he was rearrested, this time on the charge of the murder of his daughter Priscilla. The evidence was again speculative, as there had been no murder weapon or body ever found. However, he was tried and found guilty of murder, and despite an appeal, the verdict was upheld. While waiting to be sentenced, he was sent to the Ithaca jail. He passed his time there by tutoring the son of a deputy sheriff named Albert Jarvis. Edward impressed the young lad with his knowledge and oratory skills. He would also have long conversations with Albert's mother named Jane Jarvis, and both mother and son soon became convinced of Edward's innocence. Before sentencing was passed, and despite being locked inside a prison with chains around his legs, Edward escaped. It is believed that Jane and Albert Jarvis assisted him in his futile efforts to escape justice, but he was soon recaptured and the judge sentenced him to death. Edward exercised his right to appeal the sentence and he was granted a new trial. Fearing for his safety, the authorities transferred him to the prisoner to Auburn while he waited for the trial date. After much deliberation, the prosecutors decided that putting Edward on trial without any bodies or evidence would not lead to a conviction. They also decided not to prosecute him for escaping from prison, so they sent him to Pennsylvania where he was wanted on charges of jewel theft. The authorities then decided not to prosecute him and Edward walked away a free man. Edward moved to New York and rented an apartment at Irving Place in Manhattan. He was soon joined by Albert Jarvis. Edward wanted to write a book about the method in the formation of language, but he needed money to live. So he decided that at night he would go out with Al and rob local shops and warehouses. He decided to target stores that sold silks, as these were easy to resell and fetched a good price. Edward, however, was not a good thief, and in 1861 he was arrested and sentenced to two years in prison. While in prison, he met a petty criminal named Billy Dexter. He immediately thought that Billy could be of great use to him in his criminal activities, and when the two criminals were released, Billy and Edward joined forces with Al. They continued where they had left off before Edward was arrested and started robbing at night. In the summer of 1870, the three men decided to rob a dry goods store that backed onto the Chenango River in Binghamton. The store had been robbed before, so unbeknown to Edward, the owners had employed a night watchman to prevent it from happening again. Edward, Billy and Al arrived at the store at around 2.30am and swiftly broke in. They thought that this would be a quick and easy robbery but they were startled when they were suddenly confronted by the two night watchmen. The watchmen did their best to defend the store, but in the confusion a gun was fired and one of the watchmen named Fred Merrick was shot and died. The other watchmen ran out of the door to fetch help and Edward, Billy and Al quickly fled. There was only one route of escape, which was across the Shenango River, but there was a problem. Billy and Albert were poor swimmers. However, there was no option other than to try and cross the river, so the three men entered the water and started swimming. It was dark and soon they were separated. Edward made it to the other side of the river, but there was no sign of his accomplices. He waited for a while, but then he decided it was too risky to be out in the open, so hid until morning. 
The next day, two bodies were pulled from the water. The police thought that the two bodies must be two of the men who had tried to rob the store the previous night and instantly started to search for the third suspect. They soon came across a man who claimed his name was Charles Augustus. The police were suspicious of him as he was not a local man, so took him to see the two drowned men whose bodies were already on display. The police had identified them due to items in their pockets, but when the gentleman was asked if he knew who they were, he told the police that he did not. Before he could leave the scene, however, he was spotted by a local judge who immediately told the police to arrest him. Edward was arrested and taken to the police station where he was charged with the murder of Fred Merrick. His trial started on January the 4th, 1871 and it received massive interest from the press. Edward defended himself. He claimed that he was not at the scene of the crime and whoever was could not be charged of the crime as it was an act of self-defense. The prosecution, however, had some compelling witnesses, including the surviving night watchman who saw the crime and saw Edward fire the gun. At the end of the proceedings, the jury was sent out to reach their verdict. Edward's guilt was not in question, but it was whether the crime was murder or manslaughter. Edward had argued that the crime could not have been premeditated and this caused much deliberation with the jury. So much so, it took them five hours until they returned with a verdict, which was guilty of murder. Edward Ruloff was sentenced to death. Astonishingly, Edward then asked for court if he could have a stay of execution until he had finished his book. The newspapers were fascinated by his story and remarkably, public opinion started to turn in his favor. One newspaper wrote that he had been unfairly treated Others wrote that such an intelligent man should be spared to continue his work. The general public started to write letters to the newspapers demanding that Edward's sentence be commuted to life in prison. Edward now had all the fame he had always hoped his academic work would bring him and everyone seemed to have an opinion on what his fate should be. Many believed that he was insane so should be spared from any form of capital punishment. While awaiting his fate, Edward completed his book. Some of the press accused him of the murder of his sister-in-law and her child, his wife and his daughter and his two associates. So Edward decided to confess all. He admitted to the murder of his wife and described what happened on that fateful night. But he denied all the other accusations, saying he tried to save his sister-in-law and her child and his two accomplices in crime unfortunately drowned. He never mentioned his daughter, but the press speculated that Edward may have sent her to be looked after by his brother and brought up using a different name. Edward Ruloff was hanged on May the 18th, 1871 in Binghamton in front of a very large and curious crowd. He was the last person to be hanged in public in the state of New York. After his death, Edward's brain was studied by Professor Burke Green Wilder at Cornell University and it was declared to be the largest brain ever recorded. It is still currently on display at the university. Hello everyone and thank you so much for listening. As per usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have and I will see you in the next Brief Case.